Welcome to the Financial Freedom Roundtable, where each week we break down complex financial topics so that you can more easily understand them and more importantly, take action on your path to becoming financially free. If this is your first time joining us. Welcome. Grateful to have you in the room. I'm Russ Morgan. They call me the idea guy. Mostly because black up fall through guy just didn't sound so cool to me. But enough about me for a moment. Let me introduce you to my co-host, my partner. He's Italian Stallion. He's got the license plate cover to prove it. Mr. Joey Murray. Stallion, good afternoon. What's up, my friend? Do you know what an idiom is? I'm a little nervous to answer this, but I'm going to say the plural for idiot. <laughs> what, what, are you, what are you trying to say here? No, bro. An idiom is a uh, is an expression. It's something that's typically re uh, referred to kind of like as a figurative, non-literal meaning. Let me give you an example. Like uh, breaking the ice. Mm. That's, what, that's what we're doing right now. We're just breaking the ice of this podcast. Breaking work, even, right? <laughs> Uh, you know, like being your partner, biting the bullet, right? Like, I mean, or here, here's one that you would know because you're probably familiar with other people saying it, like better late than never. A hundred percent. That is, <laughs> that's my moniker. Uh, so today, bro, the title of this podcast is the imperfect investing formula, but the idiom for today's topic it, it revolves around our financial perspective, the idea of taking one step forward, but two steps back. And, and no, I'm not talking about the Olivia Rodrigo song. That's one step forward, three steps back, Mark. Don't, don't get too excited. You ready about this? Wait, why do you think, Joey, it's important for us to be breaking down the imperfect nature of investing and helping people understand from those lessons? I think if you're going to have a community around this topic of passive income investing, creating financial freedom. If you don't cover this topic, you're doing a great disservice to the rest of the people in the room because we all have had setbacks. We all have had things that we've invested in that didn't go well. Now, the people that you know that are really amazing investors all have these same issues but they just don't always talk about it. They always don't bring it to the forefront. It's not sexy to hear how you failed. They always want to talk about their successes. But at the end of the day, if you don't know that this is a part of your journey and you experience it, it can take you out of the gate. It can derail you to the point where you just give up. And that's exactly what we don't want to have happen within our own community here at Wealth Without Wall Street. Yeah, I, I love that. There's so many lessons to be learned, right? From both successes and the um, the ones that don't go well, right? Those are the lessons that really help propel us going forward. But let's let's bring in our, our dream team, man. We got the dream team of financial coaches to my left. I got a true financial Sherlock Holmes of our day. No problem too difficult to solve. If I had just known him earlier, I'd be so much richer, said everybody. Mr. Downtown Ernie Brown. Let's see Er. Man, it is good to be seen. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, man. Why do you believe today's topic is so important to recovery? Well, as I was thinking about it, I remembered last week I had this little thing called a cold. At least I think it was a cold. But I was sick. And leading up to that time, you know, got through the big move, joined a new gym, excited to get back on that that vigor program. Right, yeah. Russ? Uh -huh. get, let's, let's keep improving the health. But I had a, a little setback. I got a cold, took my energy away. And it just made me think everybody gets sick every once in a while. And if you're serious about your health, you'll have that temporary setback. But that's what it is. It's just a temporary setback. And so I think today's conversation is going to shed some light on the temporary nature of these things. And and we can look to the other side. I'm, I'm sore today. I'm well. And I'm sore today. We're back on track. Mm. I'm glad you are well. Good to see you back. Let's, Thanks, let's get around the corner to the retiree of the group. Mr. Catch me if you can. He's not killing bears with his bare hands or spear diving for tuna. He's dropping gold nuggets right here. The one and only Mr. Mark Haraguchi. Welcome, Mark. Oh, good afternoon. <clears throat> you know, when I was thinking about this all from yesterday to today, there, there was uh, one thing that came up in my mind, and I, I don't mean to ruffle any feathers, and the pun will be intended, but if we're talking about an in imperfect investing formula, um, I was thinking of the Atlanta Falcons and how they had the perfect formula going into the Super Bowl. 
and they executed to a T right up until halftime. But then the formula changed coming into halftime. Mm. And Robert Kiyosaki is fond of saying, you know, investors aren't afraid to lose because they go in with calculated risk. And if you if you play the prevent defense, you're more than likely to either lose or never get ahead. And from my uh, unsophisticated football view, um, that's what happened in in that game was a shift in the focus of rather than trying to win, it was trying not to lose what they had accumulated. Mm. Yeah, the Falcons are not afraid to lose. You know, <laughs> I, I, it is a, you know Ernie's probably familiar with this, being uh, that he grew up right outside of Atlanta. There's a saying around Atlanta: "Is go Braves and take the Falcons with you." Right. So the the Falcons definitely are the, the Thrashers. Took that advice some years ago. <laughs> and Mark, give me, I can't believe you're bringing that up again. <laughs> All right, come on. Let's let's get around the table. Uh, we got one more coach to bring in, the Piano Man. We're all in the mood for passive income. You have a C in the light, Mr. Matthew Hammond. Welcome back, Matthew. Oh, it's good to be back, Russ. Um, yeah, talking about teams that are not afraid to lose. Unfortunately, my Clemson Tigers are in that list as well this year. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm still I'm still trying to um, recover from that Clemson Florida State game, but. Talk to us about the imperfect investing formula. Why why do you believe this is important for us to cover today? Well, I mean, if you're if you're going to perfect a formula, you have to go through imperfect formulas to get to that perfection. I mean, Thomas Edison said, you know, I didn't find uh, you know, I just found ten thousand ways to fail or not to succeed. So mm. I know I totally botched that quote, but you get my point. <laughs> <laughs> it was imperfect. It is yeah, delivered. It was imperfect. But... It was imperfect. <laughs> Hey, keep it with the theme. I get it. Hey, you, you have to be willing to try in order to fail and you find lessons and find ways to improve it. All right, gentlemen, we got to cover this because we need to um, get more reps in. I think most people believe that just certain people are just lucky. Uh, some people believe, oh, they're just, they've got all the uh, knowledge. That's why they're successful. No, most of the time when you see someone who's successful, no matter what it is, they just have more reps than you. Doesn't matter for sports business, investing, they have more reps. So we're going to help you get more reps by understanding what ideas are existing out there. What are ways that we fail trying them, but also what are those lessons, those learnings, those insights that will help you avoid wasting all of that time. We're going to do that all right now. Let's belly up, jump in. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now, here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. All right, gentlemen, I need you to jump in and help me understand what is the greatest idea that you tried that didn't work, that just failed. And I don't mean just failed. I mean, went down in blanks. I, I want to know multiple things about why it failed. So first, why did you try it? You know, what, what did you do and why did you try it? And then what went wrong and what kept going wrong that you didn't see that you should have saw that maybe you should have done differently, whatever those things are. Cause I think the person listening, when they hear these ideas, they need to know all the little pieces to it because the reality is, is that the idea that you failed in someone else probably had success in or could have had success in. And I, I think the way that we give people insights and learnings around this is if they could hear that ahead of time. And then also at the end, I want us to talk a little bit about what we're doing differently now as a result of that. So Mark, can I put you on the spot? You ready to go first? Oh, I love failing first. Let's go. All right. <laughs> All right. So what idea, what was the great idea that you tried and why did you try it? It was a burr strategy and I got super excited. Yeah, exactly. Joey. It was, it was chilly. It was frosty. Yeah, it was, it was ice cold. I, I got into it because the I'm, I'm a numbers guy, right? The numbers looked phenomenal. It looked great. 
Um, and so I thought, wow, you know, you know, buy, you know, reno, rehab, you know, refi, refer, you know, redo it, retry, re, re, re. I mean, there's so many R's in the bird that I get lost. And so that was the idea that I tried because it, it seemed like it was going to be a great idea. It was a low entry point. It was going to be forced appreciation. So they had all these things that ticked off and it was real estate. And so I was, I was excited about that. Okay. Now, but what went wrong? How did this thing not work out? Because with all those R's, man, there had to be something in there that was a win. You should have started with a different question, which was what went right? Because the answer is nothing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Um, number one, here, here's a fun fact for you. I didn't know that you need to season a property before you can cash out refi it. What's should that? ask me, bro. Should have asked me. Exactly. Right. You know, if, if, if only. And so when you, when, when you do this type of strategy, you're going in and you're, and you're putting down all cash on the property and then they rehab it. And then you go and you refinance the property through a conventional lender. Well, nobody told me and shame on me for not knowing that at the time, and this has changed Joey. So fun fact for everybody else out there at the time, you needed a six month seasoning period of that property being stable and rented before you could then do a mortgage on it. I've just learned, um, everyone do your own research, but that six months is now up to 12 months. So that strategy just got completely different again for a bunch of people. Um, so that was my fail number one, not knowing that. But the fail number two was, uh, thankfully, I had my own independent inspector who would go to the property and tell me, dude, what did you buy? Because this thing is derelict. And they never did any of the work. They were just churning the property trying to get somebody new to buy it. And then they would say they would do the work and they never did it. And the city actually got involved and put me in a lawsuit saying you have a piece of property that's condemned and it's in your name. But the thing that went right, Russell, is I found a competent lawyer in the area who not only got me out of that, but showed that there was fraud and malfeasance and uh, won a court case. And we did get some of our money back. So what what are some of those deeper insights you're 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 looking back on this and you're like man is it five good attorneys from the beginning <laughs> is it confirmed <laughs> that uh that all, all the details yeah. like what what are some of i mean i i heard a lot of dang it um yeah. but looking back at that what are some of those like lessons and insights that if i wanted to do a burr right because we've had uh niti and pollock uh, come on and, and share not only on the podcast, but they've also shared in some of our um, internal mastermind conversations and they're, they're winning in a big way. I mean, Joey and I just spent time uh, with Niti up in Nashville and, and they're buying more properties and having more success than ever. So clearly the bird strategy as a whole is not bad. What are some right. of those insights you'd share? What I would share is know the operator, know their experience, know their depth of knowledge and know how long have they been in that market? Because a seasoned operator in one area does not make a qualified operator in a different area because you've got different crews, different rules, different zoning, different, you know, accessibility. And that was part of the challenge with this company was in their previous location, they apparently had a reasonably good reputation, but in this other area, they were brand new and it just turned into a boondoggle. Got it. Okay. I, I'm going to come back to you in a second. I want to, I want to talk about something that you're doing now that you can give uh, value to, but let, let me move around here to earn. Earn, you willing to go second for me? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So what was the great idea that you acted on and why? Yeah. Uh, well, a couple of years ago I said, you know, I want to, I want to invest. I want to be a long-term rental guy. And I found a property it was a triplex and I thought, wow, I can get three doors and one roof and one mortgage. I thought that's going to be really efficient. That's going to be really effective. And so I jumped on that deal. Tell me, it sounded good at three doors instead of one. Everybody says, oh man, there's efficiency and having, you know, only one roof, not having all the different things. You have the ability for having all these people together versus having three separate units. What went wrong? Yeah. Well, it was a good idea, but <laughs> in two to three months, I can't remember exactly when, but early, immediately, <laughs> I got a message. Uh, I got a voicemail from the property management group, not an email, a voicemail that said, hey, I need you to call me. 
And they said, we had tons of rain and we have a tenant who said, we've got water in their unit. And so we took the liberty of going get a quote on this foundation repair and it's going to be 10 grand. Oh, that's Ouch. nice. Yeah. That's awesome. And so I was super happy to get that news, went and shared that with Caroline and she was even more excited <laughs> to get that news. She said, we're never investing again. <laughs> that's, that's probably true. And not, so that, that happens. And so as I look at that, I thought, wow. Not, not only am I going to have to spend this money, we just put north of 80 grand to get into this thing, but immediately about to have to put another 10 grand in a way that's not going to increase rent, right? That's, this isn't improving that property. This is maintaining that property immediately. And therefore, I'm looking at a year before this thing becomes profitable for me. And I was pretty discouraged. Yeah. Well, well give us some insights around that, man. What's a lesson... Now, looking back on that, that uh, another potential investor, maybe someone who is doing the first or second deal similar to what you were doing at the time, what's a lesson, insight that they can glean from this? Yeah, I'm joking, but don't don't buy properties that leak water. <laughs> uh, but what I learned, and I just kind of worked my way through this, is I said, okay, this is the situation. That's okay. I didn't put all of my money into this deal. So we could pay for this if we needed to. I said, well, I, I'm not just going to accept that this property management group is acting in my best interest. I think that they are, but I'm not just going to blindly follow that. Um, here's what happened and here's your quote. Pay for this and let's move on. Uh, I'm not going to take that. Um, I did have the viewpoint that it's it's my responsibility mm -hmm. to manage the management company. And so I said, well, um, you know, thanks for that. Um, is it possible for you to get a second quote? They said, okay, fine. And in the meantime, I took the first quote and called a friend, so a neutral third party, um, a guy that uh, when we were out of college went and worked for a foundation repair company, a sales guy. I said, hey, here's what they're thinking about doing. Does this repair seem like, is this, out of, is this, is this normal? Like, does this scope of work seem appropriate? And is this price point? correct. And uh, he said it was, by the way, he said, this, this seems about right. But what I learned is we went and got that second group of um, contractors out there and they said, well, actually we don't find, we don't see any evidence of continual leaking. We had really an unprecedented kind of storm. And also we found that this, this repair has already been done to this property. Well, Which, by the way, it was in the inspection. So shame, shame on me for not pointing that out immediately. And so the second crew said, Hey, we're not, we don't need to do this repair. This, this property is fine. If this happens again, maybe we'll look at it and maybe you should go back to the group and see if you can find out who did the foundation repair in the first place and see if there's a warranty on that. So dodge the bullet. Um, that from this point forward, you, Russ. <laughs> from this point forward, I'm calling Earth. Hey, Earn, I got this issue with my air conditioner. Um, yeah, it's the third time. Yeah, same air conditioner. Um, I've only been here, that's right, six years. It should, no, nope, yep, it shouldn't have happened again. I shouldn't write the check. I should ask the people to, to get a second. Oh, man. Man, there's just so much wisdom in that, right? Like, don't taking things at face value, dig it a little bit deeper. Mm. How about you, Stallion? What, what was your big idea. What was the thing that, that you, you took off on and why was it so, uh, such a big idea for you? Why did you want to do it? Well, you know, Russ, I haven't always been the Italian stallion. I don't, you know, I don't know if you know, at one point, you know, I was into unicorns, a hundred <laughs> unicorns to be exact. <clears throat> um, actually it did not happen in that order, but it is a funny story that one time I was told by a trusted friend, man, it's so crazy how people will sell anything online. Like there's all these crazy ideas and he just pulls up his phone. He's like, Hey, look, I mean, look at this. There's a website for sale, a hundred unicorns.com. Isn't that crazy? And I'm like, how much do they want for it? <laughs> Which by, by the way is the wrong question to ask. Um, 
And then I just said, you know what? I'm a dad of five daughters. I want to buy a website. This is so easy. It's drop shipping. Anybody can do drop shipping. You don't even have to have actual inventory. So I'm just going to buy this website. It's already done for you, right? I just literally connect the dots with people that want to buy unicorns and people in China. I mean, this is so, so easy. It, what could go wrong with this? I mean, this is such a brilliant strategy. I, hey, by the way, I, I am selling something. I don't know what it is yet. Um, how much you want to pay for it? Exactly. Which, by the way, there's a lot more than two steps back on this one, but I'm going to limit it to two. The first one is I did zero research on actually what you do with a drop shipping website. Are you shocked by this? That, that, no, no surprise there. Literally did no research. I was just like, this is so simple. I mean, arrogance. Okay. So that was number one. And then number two is I realized you have to actually drive people to the website. You have to actually drive people marketing to the website. And I know nothing about marketing online, especially Google ads, Facebook ads. Like think of all the ads that, you know, people have knowledge of. And I have 0.0% knowledge of any of them. And so I'm literally taking over this website from this guy who, by the way, was very patient with me. <laughs> spent, was. I'm talking spent five or six meetings with me, Zoom meetings, showing me how he was doing all these things. And yeah, shocker, I was paying more in ads than I was ever bringing in for months. Mm. And uh, I had to just stop all the nonsense and say, I am not an operator, right? That was, are we on to lessons learned yet? Or, or do I still need to give you more <laughs> steps back? So the big idea was you can buy things online and you're like, I'm going to prove I can. So you did. And, and help, and it, just, no, no, you forgot the most important thing. I'm trying to help my daughters, Russ. Yes. Ask me how many times my daughters actually saw the inner workings of a drop shipping business online. I'm going to assume it's close to your knowledge on ads. 0, 0.0 times because I couldn't figure it out. So how am I going to teach them the inner workings of this thing? So, so what's the lesson? What's the, I mean, a lot of people are like, this is an obvious one, but you've had, a, you've had enough time. You've had enough beatings that I've given you and pretty much all our whole community have given you around the subject. What is the insight and learning from this? I've shared this before, but knowing your investor DNA, what sort of investor you are, one of the most glaringly obvious things about me is I am not an operator. I never have been. I never will be. And so anything that I invest in has to have an amazing operator. A, somebody who is knowledgeable, who has the time, who has the ability and the energy to complete this. I have now, Russ, and I'm just, I'm, I'm putting it out there. Okay. I have identified and partnered with the best person I know who is going to operate a hundred unicorns and get actual products on Amazon for me. So we're going from drop shipping to Amazon. Mm. And it's all because I stepped back and I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I cannot operate these unicorns out of the stables anymore. Okay. They are stuck in the stables. I need someone else to help them fly. Okay. All right. Uh, and Matthew, I'm, just, I'm marking this day. Mark uh, it down. Uh, it's about to be on. It's man, about I've, to be just. Ernie, we're, we've got this, this one timestamp for the future. Yeah, that's, that's legendary. If you've listened to our show for any length of time, you've heard us talk about infinite banking and how we were able to use that concept to create over $50,000 a month in passive income. But it's just not that easy to figure out how does this all connect into my own personal system? Stallion, that's why we created the Passive Income Operating System, bro. It shows you how to turn active income into passive income. It makes all the steps come together. 
If you would like to get access to it as a podcast listener, we've never given this away in public before. Go to whatswhatwallstreet.com forward slash P-I-O-S. There was nothing worse than walking into class when you're in school and the teacher saying, pop quiz day. Why? Because you were unprepared. Are you unprepared though for financial freedom? Don't be. Find out how close you are by taking our 30 second quiz at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash quiz. I got a chance to watch the the movie um, Elizabeth Town. You guys familiar with this movie? Claire Danes and is it some, what's the Bloom guy? I don't know. Anyway, I watched one out of 10 movies you've ever seen, Chris. The, the last scene one out of 100 it, for me. The last scene is the cousin in the movie and his band who are coming back together and they play the song um, Free Bird by Leonard Skinner and they release this like paper mache bird over the top of the wedding party and it catches on fire and just it's a big disaster. I think letting them fly and the disaster and burning down something is it's all in your future. All right, Matthew. Okay. I'm like an all-state commercial neat. Matthew, I got I, I put you behind Joey. <laughs> it's only up from here, Matt. I mean, there's just no way but to win after that. So, t- tell me what what was your big idea? What was the thing that you that you thought, man, this this can't miss? And why did you do it? All right. Well, first of all, I need to set the stage. So, not not too terribly long ago, it felt like every every investment that I was touching was a success. Like, I mean, it was just, you know, everything. I bought a short-term rental. It doubled in value. I had 100% cash on cash the first year. You know, I went into the land business. I was cash flowing from the land business. Like, everything I was doing, just boom, boom, boom. I was just making money hand over fist. And I felt untouchable. Now, I don't know who said this quote, but I, I read a quote that said, there are no failures, only lessons. Well, I think the good Lord in his infinite wisdom felt that it was time for me to have a good lesson. So, so that brings me back to the, the grand idea that I had. So again, I was making a lot of money. I was in a position where I was actually going to owe a lot of taxes to the IRS. And I, you know, I know hate's a strong word, but I hate giving money to the government period. (laughs) And so I was going to do everything I could to avoid it legally, obviously, but you know, and I, and I was searching and searching and it was like the clouds parted an investment came out of the sky that not only touted amazing tax benefits, I could actually wipe out my entire tax liability for the year, but it also had amazing returns as well. Mm. And so, I mean, my, my prayers were answered, you know, I, after talking with other people, uh, you know, or her considering the same investment. And I actually did do a little due diligence on my own, um, which consisted of me just finding the dotted line on the investor agreement to sign. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, I pretty much just jumped right at the opportunity because it, I mean, it literally was the answer to all of my perceived problems at the time. So, so it's a big opportunity. You got tax benefits, you got cash flow, and man, God is blessing everything. Here's just another opportunity. But I, I feel a big, big but in this saying. Capital B U T, but it couldn't have crashed and burned any worse. I mean, not only was the investment a failure, it was a fraud. It was a literal fraud. And so my entire investment was lost. Um, at least at the moment, you know, hopefully I will retain some, uh, some of those funds later in the future, but as of right now, it's a total loss. Ooh, what, what went wrong? What, what, what's the big problem? Well, I will tell you the, the failure is on me. You know, my first mistake was I let the tax tail wag the dog. You know, I was looking at all these taxes that I was going to owe. And that was my 100% focus. You know, I was already making money from these other investments. So now I just want to pocket more money by not giving extra money to the government. And so I let the tax tail wag the dog, which basically led to my second mistake, which obviously I did not do enough due diligence. And, um, you know, and I invested in this opportunity, which one, I did not understand fully. And two, I was really blinded by the the perceived benefits that it was touting, you know, without really considering the red flags that in retrospect were really shining through on the press and on, on the investment. All right. So let, let's talk about some of those insights and lessons, because I mean, it, 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 we've talked about this before that 
Ponzi schemes, unfortunately, are way more common than we're led to believe, right? They, I think there's a, a website out there, and I forget, it's like ponzitracker.com or something like that. And it's like 60 to 90 every single year and fairly large numbers. So these are way more common. They're, it's like the seven degrees from Kevin Bacon, you can find seven degrees to a Ponzi scheme. Like the there's so many people have been impacted by this. So what are some of those insights and lessons that you've gathered on this that you're like, man, this is how somebody investing in things in the future can win for my insights? Well, listen, I want to cover two things. So so the practical lessons are, are somewhat obvious. You know, I need to do proper due diligence <laughs> when analyzing these investments, uh, not just look for the dotted line to sign. Um, and two, I don't let don't let the problems that I'm trying so desperately to solve blind me as I'm trying to look for that solution. Mm -hmm. Now, those are the practical uh, insights. Now, frankly, the biggest lesson I learned from this was it was purely psychological. Now, I'm gonna I'm gonna get vulnerable here for a minute. I'm gonna pretend like I'm not on a podcast with thousands of people listening. But you know, I would love to sit here or stand here in my case right now and tell you that this doesn't fa it didn't phase me, and I was able to get right back on the horse with the next investment opportunity that came my way. But frankly, I, I mean, I, I'm not gonna lie, especially to the thousands of people that are listening. You know, the absolute I mean, this absolutely killed my confidence. I mean, for a long time. I mean, I was so gun shy at every opportunity that came my way. I mean, I literally put a halt on investing altogether for a while. But uh, you know, after after a lot of prayer um, and and awesome talks with my wife, I will tell you, my wife was a true blessing because not only is she an entrepreneur, but she actually went through <clears throat> not a Ponzi scheme, but she actually went through a similar failure in the past with her with her investing and lost a lot of money, which which was. I mean, a horrible situation for her, but a huge benefit for me because at least she's already experienced it. And that wasn't her first experience <laughs> with the failure. But I came to a realization that either I'm going to own my mistakes or I'm going to let my mistakes own me. And so that was really the push that I needed to get back in the game. No, that's that's good. And here's a great lesson for us all is that when people around us are doing deals, it's to ask them what went right and what went wrong and looking back on it, what are those insights and lessons from it? And the more curious we are about opportunities, the more ways that we see things happening, the more reps we get, whether they're actual reps doing them or us like doing reps through other people that way. We, we were on a call yesterday, Joey, and I remember the, the, the person we were interviewing, uh, they were talking about a, having someone else who was investing and then going to them every like two or three months and saying, Hey, how's that deal working? Tell me about how that deal is working. And every, every two, three months, they go back and get, gain insight and use that to gain confidence and gain information. Right. That's right. Yep. All right. I, I'm going to share one with you here. So this is it. Many of you have heard us interview both Ryan Bly and Matty J on our podcast and, and talk a little bit about Truro. And I think that I had, like you, Joey, this idea that I wanted to start a business with my kids that would give them insights around how to run a business and also how to make investing fun, right? Like, who doesn't like cars? I thought, hey, we can get these cars and we can use them too, right? Like have liabilities on wheels uh, become assets doing deals or something like that. I can't say it nearly as good as Matty J said, but that's, <laughs> I, that was like exciting to me. I was like, I want to, I'm going to encourage you not to try that in the future. <laughs> Russ. Like let, let's leave that to Matty J. Okay. All right. I, I'm not as good at riding, but I'm thinking like, who doesn't want to drive nicer cars? Who doesn't want to have those cars paid for? And when you have an 18 year old and I, I had one that was about to be 16, I thought I'm going to have to buy more cars anyway to be able to, handle that. I've got a 13 year old behind it. Here's an opportunity here. And so here's some of the, the things that didn't go well, right? Like, so the idea was great. I've seen others have a lot of success in this area, but one of the things that I didn't understand and was, uh, there's limitation, uh, Mark, as you were talking about before, like you didn't know that it, that you had to have the loan season for me. I didn't realize there's limitations for you to be able to rent the car to yourself personally. 
with unless you had at least five of these cars. And yeah, I, I only had one at the time. And then I bought a second one. That was the second mistake because I didn't understand the limitations around the insurance when I had the first one. And so I was fouling it up. I was driving it, not knowing that I had actually 300 miles per month total that I could drive it when it was not rented. Meaning that had I wrecked it on the trip down to the lake and back, haul in some lake gear because it was a pickup truck, I would have been well over, well over my 300 mile limit and none of it had been covered. And in, if I would have hit someone else, wouldn't have been covered. My personal insurance wouldn't have covered that it would have excluded it. So I was literally driving a liability around to, to myself and everything that I had built because I didn't realize the limitations on the insurance part. That was a huge, huge issue. Secondly, I buy this second car thinking, oh, this is going to be the car hack for my daughter. I'm going to give her car to the 16, soon to be 16 year old. I'll let her drive the nicer one, but I'm going to let the, the rental pay for it because I got like this uh, convertible, right? Like what, what girl does not want a convertible sports car? It's pretty, you know, it's nice. And I thought, you know, Hey, that's probably a weekend or two. I'll drive that thing. Well, then I end up finding out, no, you can't rent it to yourself unless you have five of these. And you know, another lesson, uh, Joey, I learned is that if you try to go back and sell a car immediately a, a week later, you've heard the saying that it immediately depreciates as you drive it off the lot. 100%. It, it was worth $7,000 less. And I had less than 100 miles on it. Ouch. And I'm like, how is that possible? It's the same car. They're like, yeah, but now it has two owners instead of one. And two, no, two owners versus one re reduces its value significantly. And I'm like, I didn't know that. <laughs> I mean, like, oh man, what, what an idiot. So now I've got this suck cost in this car. I'm like, I, I'm not going to take a $7,000 hit. So what, what am I going to do now? I'll even top it. We, we said there was two, like one step forward, two steps back. I got a third step back here. Ooh. I also learned that you have to collect for city, county, and state sales taxes. Yeah, I, I hadn't had done that in my calculation, right? So the 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 math that I was using of what I needed to earn was not counting that in addition to all the other items. So I, I'm looking back at this and I'm like, okay. What, what's my practical application? What's the lesson that I've learned? Well, first, um, wh whenever you're doing things for, for your kids, you've got to make it fun. And it, when you're losing money, it's not fun. Also, we want to teach our kids how to do things the right way. Well, I was teaching them how to run a business at a loss. And I don't want to do that. Right. I mean, I know that Joey, you've been teaching your kids that through this hundred unicorns deal. And I, I don't want to follow in your footsteps on that, bro. I like, got that covered for you. I got yeah, it. Yeah. Like seriously, it's like, Hey, if you guys want to see a business run into loss, go over there and watch uncle Joey. He'll, he'll show you get, get, you know, working in magic here, unicorns. Hey Joey, I'm going, to go on, I'm going to go on that website and order a unicorn right now. Just to, <laughs> just to try to counteract. Thank it. you. Uh, the Morgans don't believe in that stuff. <laughs> we don't believe in unicorns. Music, yeah. money, magic, unicorns, <laughs> any of that stuff. <laughs> this, this just isn't, this isn't it. So I'm like, you know, uh, I, I, I've got to ask the right questions, but the, the practical application for me in all seriousness is like really get clear on what you want. We say that a lot. But like, if you go through this and, and I would have said, yeah, I want to teach them a business, but I also want them to car hack. Like that was like, if I, if I had the two things, that would have been it. Like making money was not the thing. I want to learn a business and I want to be able to car hack. And so then in order to understand how to car hack, I would have had to ask those questions and somebody with expertise could have told me, by the way, Russ, you're going to need five of these to car hack. And I'm going to be like, yeah, I'm not going to do five. And so that would have ended it from the very beginning. I, I think just knowing what you want and getting so clear on the front end of what you want before you do it allows you to ask great questions. All right, Mark, 
right, we got to wrap this podcast up. We we've covered what you did. You did the burr, right? And all of the lessons that you learned, but now let's, let's, let's wrap it up, put a nice bow on it. Talk about now what? Well, now what is you've got to keep moving forward. I mean, if, if, if I would have let that one failure in that investment strategy, if I would have let that failure cloud everything that I did going forward, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. So what I took the takeaway is number one, understand what I'm, what I'm, what I'm getting into, understand the people that I'm getting into partnership with, and then be ready to learn because even if it works out perfect, I mean, out of, out of all of us here, the only person who didn't pull a unicorn card, uh, was Ernie because Ernie turned his unicorn card into a real card and was able to navigate through that. And so that to me is, it's, it, it's a mindset thing of you've got to be ready to fail because if you're not failing, you're not learning. But obviously sometimes I, I'd, I'd rather skip the learning process and just get to the win. All right, Ernie, now what? Well, uh, after that experience, I decided to start a foundation repair company. No, just kidding. <laughs> I was kidding. Uh, but I'm sure you've had this experience. Someone comes up to you and says, hey, I got good news and bad news. Right? We know that experience. And I think as investors, I think we we get excited about, I got some good news, right? But I think we, we kind of push off. We get the scenario where it's like, hey, I got some good news, but in six months, I'm going to have some bad news for you. You're like, I'll take it. Right. But the, the thing that I, that, that this experience solidified for me is there, there's going to be bad news. Right. And I would rather take the, I've got good news and bad news and know what that is than not know what the bad news is in, in coming months. So just as a real estate investor, I, I did just stop, still have that property at another property. Um, <laughs> also pivoted, created a land business, right? There's no foundation repair. <laughs> In the land business, the <laughs> risk of that. Um, but I, I'm a better investor for having that experience, keep cash in reserve, and and look, what where is the bad news in here? And how can I be on top of that? So that's that's what I'm doing now. So good. Matty, now what? So so one thing I learned from from this investment, and honestly, even if it had been a successful investment, I, I would have still learned this lesson that I'm not a big fan of investments that that take the control out of my hands. I'm not saying that I want to create a job for myself, but I do want to have some sense of control over what I'm investing in. Um, and frankly, investing in these types of investments, whether it's syndications, you're putting the control in the operator's hands and <laughs> frankly, you may get a bad operator, <laughs> which obviously I did. So so as far as moving forward, you know, I'm officially back on the horse. I am investing again, but I think I'm going to focus more on purchasing businesses, uh, you know, maybe online businesses, you know, where I have more control over what I'm purchasing, you know, and, and as far as I have more control, because the, the successful investments I've done up to this point, I've had control. My short-term rental, I've had control. It's been super successful. So, you know, I have that history of, you know, I have that history of, um, of success with these investments that I control. And so that's, that's, that's what I'm doing to move forward. Right. As long as that horn's on the saddle and not on its head, you're in good shape. All right. Stallion. I'll go ahead and tell you this. Um, one, the, what I did was I, I kind of stopped the bleeding, right. In the things that I could control to, to Matthew's point, I stopped in doing all the ad stuff that I didn't understand. I took inventory of what was going on, what was what was the issue? Like what what were the things that I'm facing that are keeping this from being successful? And it, what that did is that it helped me identify again that I need an operator. I need somebody who actually has the time and expertise to do this. I'm happy to put the money behind it. I'm happy to then have that operator help me teach these daughters the skills that we're talking about. And so it allowed me to go find exactly where, what I was missing. Um, so that's what I would say. Like if you can still revive something that was a poor decision to begin with, take those steps. And, uh, yeah, I have really positive future ahead of me. Um, contrary to your belief for us, and it will be proven wrong. Hey man, I'm rooting for you. I mean, I sort of am not, not because really, it, not it, really. it makes our podcast way more interesting when 
I get to keep making fun of you. But I guess you could have it be interesting the opposite way. But I mean, like, let me show you how I made up for this thing. What I rubbed right. in your face. Yes. Exactly. And we're all rooting for you, bro. Unicorns and all. Here, here's the thing that my, my girls and I are doing now is that we, like Matthew, we're, we're following very similar. We're, uh, Sophie Howard came on our podcast. And if you guys haven't uh, listened to that podcast, I'll point you, uh, what is it, Joey? Like, what's what, wallstreet.com forward slash freedom navigator? I think that's it. An amazing podcast, but we're going through a program right now. And I guess three of the, the five of us are going through it on how to buy different websites. And I'm not trying to buy unicorns. I literally buy the content website that allows the girls to learn and earn immediately. <laughs> and, and to me, like fast wins. I've learned that kids have short attention spans, even shorter than mine. They need to start earning money immediately. So we're going to be buying a profitable website and hopefully uh, we'll end up earning more money than we spent to, to buy it. But we, we've got some ideas. I'll share those hopefully on a future passive income report and we'll compare uh, unicorns to it. As always, I hope that you, as you listen to this podcast, you, you, you found that there is a imperfect formula to investing. And, but there's always lessons. And the way that we find out how to do better is by learning from others. And that was our big objective, our big promise for you today is that we would share an idea with you, share the failures that went wrong with it, but also some insights and learnings behind it. If you found value in this, take time, rate, review the show, share it with somebody else so we can beat the big tech algorithm. Have an amazing day. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.